Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today is October the 10th in the year of our Lord, 2017, and this is one a day for the soul. Now, I trust that you are feeling blessed and happy in Jesus this morning and that you are ready for a good word from the Lord. Now, we're continuing our look into the book of Job, and we are continuing through chapter 5. And a couple of days ago, I told you that you, when, when reading the book of Job, because there's so much that is said in response to Job's situation by his three friends, that we must look very carefully to distinguish what it was that God actually found disfavor with. And we see that in this chapter. You see, in the first reading of the chapter, it may appear that Eliphaz is speaking words of wisdom. And although much of what he says is true, he misstates and he misunderstands suffering from the Lord. You see, he is equating everything about Job's suffering to Job's sinfulness. But there are three aspects to the suffering of man that must be distinguished one from the other. You see, we read in verse 18 of chapter 5 that it is the Almighty that makes sore, and it is the Almighty that binds up. It is the Almighty that wounds, and it is the Almighty whose hands make whole. And so what we see in this is that it is the Almighty that suffering is placed upon on man, all types of suffering. And there are three specific purposes to each of them. First, we see the suffering that is placed upon the ungodly. And obviously, this is a form of punishment to get them to see the errors of their ways. Then we have the suffering of the righteous. And this can come in two forms. This can come in the form of discipline, when we become disobedient in our service to the Lord, when we begin to turn our back on God and venture out into the world, its ways, its practices, and its systems, but it can also be a form of purging, causing a distaste for the world and a desire or a pursuing of holy things. Now, before we elaborate on that, there may be those who have a problem with the fact of suffering coming from the hand of God. But if you would, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 2 and look at verse 6. It says, It is the Lord, the Almighty, that kills, and it is the Almighty that makes alive. He brings down to the grave, and he brings up. The Lord makes poor, and he makes rich. He brings low, and he lifts up. You see, as we mentioned in the first couple of chapters in our look into the book of Job, Satan can do nothing unless the Lord allows it. He is King of Kings, speaking of the Almighty. He is Lord of Lords. There is none equal to him. There certainly is none exalted above him. And so everything that happens, happens by the hand of the Lord. It's important that we understand this so that when these trials these tests, these moments of suffering come upon us, we can again look to the Lord and ask not, why is this happening to me, but what do you want me to learn from it? Because there is a lesson behind every form of suffering, every form of pain, every form of misery and agony that we experience. There is a lesson to be learned. So again, ask not the question, why is this happening to me? But what is it you would have me learn from this, my God and my King? Then our eyes will be open to see the truth. But let's just take a closer look for a moment at the three forms of suffering. Now I'm borrowing from a commentary series by Kiel and DeLich. I don't know if you can see this or not. If you don't have this, I would certainly recommend that you get it. It's an entire commentary series on the Old Testament. Now listen what they have to say about the first form, the godless. This is the one who has fallen away from God, is visited with suffering from God, for sin and the punishment of sin. 
This suffering of the godless is the effect of the divine justice in punishment. It is chastisement under the disposition of wrath. Although it is not yet final wrath, that will come on the day of judgment. But it is a punitive suffering and therefore a form of God's wrath. Now, on the other hand, the second type of suffering is the sufferings of the righteous. Now, these flow from the divine love of God, to which even all that has the appearance of wrath in this suffering must be subservient as the means only by which it operates. So in other words, even though God may be appearing to deal with us through anger, it's actually divine love, the love of a parent disciplining their child. It continues by saying, although the righteous man is not accepted from the wickedness and sinfulness of the human race, he can never become an object of God's divine wrath. So long. Now that's the key words here, friends. So long as his inner life is directed towards God. In other words, he is sincerely pursuing God. And his outward life is governed by the utmost earnest striving after sanctification. God sends affliction to them more and more to purge away the sin which still has power over them and to rouse them from the danger of carnal security, to maintain in them the consciousness of sin as well as of grace and with it the lowliness of penitence to render the world and its pleasures bitter as gall to them, to draw them from the creature and bind them to himself by prayer and devotion. And so when we come through these times of suffering, when we come out the other side, we, can, we should come out stronger, more committed, more dedicated, more allegiant to our God and our service unto him. Now the third and final form of suffering is that God ordains suffering for the righteous in order to prove their fidelity to himself and to prove their earnestness after sanctification, especially their trust in God and their patience. You'll recall we talked about that a couple of days ago. Now in this, he also permits Satan. He allows Satan who impeaches them to tempt them to sift them as wheat in order that he may be confounded and the divine choice justified in order that it may be manifest that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities are able to separate them from the love of God and to tear away their faith from God, which has remained steadfast, notwithstanding every apparent manifestation of wrath. But again, it's not wrath, it's divine love. Such suffering, according to a common figure, is for the godly what the smelting furnace or the refining pot is to precious metals. Now, if you haven't heard this illustration before, basically you take a large metal pot, you put your gold in or your precious metal, you heat it up and all the impurities rise to the top while the heavy costly metals will sink to the bottom. And that's what God does in us through suffering. The suffering allows all the impurities to rise to the top. We're aware of them. We can deal with them. And through prayer and repentance, God can cleanse us from them. Now, the speech of Eliphaz, as beautiful as it may appear on the surface, misses two of these objectives. And instead of consideration to Job, his friend, that God may be using this as a purging, sanctifying process in Job's life, Eliphaz automatically equates Job's suffering to Job's sin. And that's what causes the Almighty to speak so negatively to Eliphaz at the end of the book in his rebuke. Now, what can we learn from this? Well, first of all, we can learn that even though Eliphaz may have had good intentions, he spoke wrongly. And how often do we do the same thing? With good intentions, we speak before we consider what it is we're saying. There are far too many voices in this world that are speaking on behalf of God, and yet they haven't stopped to consider what it is that they're saying. And there are far too many people walking around this earth thinking that they understand the things of God, 
and they have no clue to what God really feels about a particular situation. And that's why the Bible is so important to us, because we don't take what God has to say on a particular matter by what the masses tell us. We go to his word and his word alone for guidance and direction. And so if there's any matter in your life that you have a question about, the first place that you should turn should be the Bible. Not a psychiatrist, not your friend, not your parents. They should all be second to the Bible. The Bible is our rule. And when we read the Bible, and many times we may not like what we read, we still are to conform ourselves to what the Bible says, not our own feelings and certainly not our own hearts. There are a lot of good intentioned people that are walking through this world blind. And the unfortunate thing is that they're leading many along with them. And maybe that's what the Bible means when it says in Proverbs chapter 29, a fool utters all his mind. In other words, he speaks without consideration. But a wise man keepeth it in till afterwards. Till after what? Until after he's consulted with God. Until after he's consulted with the word of God. Until he has considered what the heart and mind of God is on the particular issue based upon the entire word of God as it is presented to us. Which means most of the time we should keep our mouth closed and be considered fools instead of opening our mouths and being known as fools. Well, I love you, friends. We're going to close there today. We'll pick up in chapter 6 next time. I'm so grateful that you're again with us. I pray the Lord Jesus will bless your journey. I pray that all you do will bring him glory and praise and that you'll be a little bit more like Jesus today than you were yesterday. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I love you. I'll see you on the next video.